The Hangout is live. Awesome. Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Sammy K. Powers, and this is the PHP Roundtable. This is a live podcast of developers discussing topics that PHP nerds care about. And the ultimate goal of this podcast is to learn a little something from each other. And if you're listening live and you want, a little, you want to be a part of this little shindig, send a tweet to PHP Roundtable. I've got it pulled open right here. Looking for notifications. Oh, Chuck Shirely just uh, tweeted that, uh, should I be seeing this at 12.14 CDT? And it's like, this is going to be going live soon. Yes, uh, sorry, we, we had a little bit of a late start. We were having some technical difficulties with Hangouts and bugs in Chrome. So we got it all sorted out, though. So now we're live. Um, we'd love to have you guys be a part of the show uh, by um, chiming in on Twitter uh, if you have some questions for um, anything related to Behat or testing or things like that. So. What are we talking about? Oh, Chuck just tweeted, never mind. <laughs> he figured it out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I hope it's because he figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and not because he just gave up. <laughs> the Hat is an open source behavior-driven development framework for PHP. What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out today, because today we're talking about uh, this thing called the Hat. We're going to get a brief overview of what it is and how it helps us write uh, more reliable code. And we're going to explore some best practices that we can sort of um, try to follow when we're writing our automated tests for apps. And so now that we know what we're talking about, let's meet our lovely panel. we got two lovely people with us today, starting off uh, in no particular order. We're going to start off with Jessica Maurerhan. And she has been a software developer for 12 years and a software engineer, uh, I should say, for 12 years. And for the past five years, has been focusing on TDD and BDD. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. And we also have, uh, for another round of the PHP Roundtable, uh, Konstantin Kudra Kudrashov. He told me not to even try his last name. Just say AKA Everzet. <laughs> what was that? Told you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I told you, you would mess it up. Creator of the hat, co-creator of PHP Spec, and head the practice at Invac Invac Invi Invica. 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 Yeah. I, I, I should have um, I should have been able to um, write a pronunciation key for that, but um, for some reason I asked you how to spell it exactly, and then I knew I would mispronounce it if I tried to read the exact spelling, <laughs> and then I didn't write the pronunciation key. So there we are. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> now we got now we got you pronouncing it three times, so it's, it's all good. It all paid off. Extra, extra air time for sure. Chuck just chimed in that he figured it out, so it, looks, it sounds like he's watching. So thanks, Chuck. Um, hi, Chuck. <laughs> hi, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, hi, everyone. Yes, yes. So the, um, w I guess just to kind of start off, I, I do have some specific things I want to kind of get into um, for specific use cases, kind of show, <coughs> discuss some specific scenarios that popped up for me when I was um, writing the hat test for a project recently, and um, and we can get into that. But before that. For those who kind of aren't familiar with this um, sort of testing stuff, uh, maybe they do unit tests with PHP unit. What's the difference between, like, we hear this stuff in, in PHP, like you got acceptance testing, system testing, functional testing, integration testing, unit testing, all these kinds of testings that we can do. What it, what does Behat do? What kind of testing does Behat do? And how does it fit into, like, the whole testing, testing World. paradigm? Um. Jessica, if you don't mind, I, I can start. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I think um, Everzet would be much better uh, to start off. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, and I'm going to say that because I feel like if I say, try and say Constantine, is that right, Constantine? Yep, yep. Okay. Well, right. <laughs> so, so I think the easiest way to describe it is like, not the easiest, I guess, but Behat itself is, is a BDD tool. And I think there are other tools that came from BDD community like R spec, uh, like PHP spec, and others that you can you can say that they're BDD tools, but you can equally say they're TDD tools, or you can say they're unit testing tools. Behat is more um, more specific in, uh, in that regard. It is part in particular a BDD tool. And the reason why I'm saying it is that because you can use Behat to test at very different levels, right? It doesn't it doesn't narrow you down. There is this misconception in community going on, which is uh, people use like ninety percent of people use Behat for UI testing, but that doesn't mean that you are forced to use it for end-to-end -end acceptance test uh, UI testing, right? Uh, it just means that many people choose to. Um, at the same time, you can use Behat to write 
unit tests, for example, right? It's you can apply it at different levels. And the reason why it happens is because we had this as a tool uh, separates semantics of you describing the problem from the automatic part of you testing the problem. And when the separate when the separation happens, the way you describe the problem starts being very distinctive separate or different from the way you test the problem. Uh, essentially, BHAD is, is an acceptance testing tool. Um, it's a way to have a conversation with your stakeholder, with people that will actually use the system in the, long, in, in the end. And then find a way to first automate that conversation and then implement, uh, implement your system or write the code in the way that fulfills that expectation. There is no obligation at which level you are fulfilling this expectation. So this is where a lot of the practices spawned in the last couple of years from BDD community come from. This is where like uh, ideas like modeling by example come from. You separate conversations. You separate thinking about the problem from you actually implementing the solution. And I think this is where BIAT as a tool shines. Is it basically we all heard about this TDD cycle where you describe the problem first, then you try to write the, uh, the simplest possible, stupidest possible solution, and then you refactor. What BIHAD does, it pushes this idea, BIHAD and BDD in general, pushes this idea to extreme and, they, and introduces an explicit separation between thinking and talking about the problem and implementation of the problem. So that's kind of a uh, high level, I'm sure we will go into details, but. This is how I see it. And I'm sure Jessica will be able to kind of fill the gaps that I just introduced. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. Um, I always tell people that I find it to be um, more of a tool for communication and documentation, uh, more so than um, automated testing for bugs. Um, and yeah, I, I do see a lot of people focus really heavily on UI and end-to-end -end testing. Um, and they are missing out on a lot of stuff that BHAT could enable you to do. Because um, yeah, it does not have to be just end-to-end -end slow tests actually launching a browser. Um, but the biggest value that I've gotten out of BHAT and BDD in general is just really improving communication processes and making sure that the software that we're delivering is actually suiting the user's needs and everyone understands how it works. Yep. That's really interesting that you say that um, you know, so many people focus on the end-to-end -end aspect, you know, this acceptance testing, testing the UI, and that's sort of, I feel like that's what the, when I think of BHAT, that's kind of the first thing that pops into my mind, but really, yeah. the, it seems like the the real benefit here is actually when we're talking about communicating with the, the clients or the, the stakeholders, right, with, with when they, when they, um, like, even recently, I had a client that just said, hey, like, we, we, we really want to make sure that we're covering all the bases that this thing doesn't break. Can I just send you some user stories and uh, see if we can maybe do some, start use that as a starting point? I'm like, actually, yeah, we could just turn that straight into something <laughs> called Gherkin and turn it into an automated test, in fact, um, yeah. which was made possible by Behat. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah, spot on. And it's like, it's essentially like, it's a very, it, it's about selling points, right? People jump on things which uh, look amazing and look awesome. And I know because I was that person, I jumped on, on the behalf, mm -hmm. on, on the Gherkin and Cucumber bandwagon just for, you know, like UI testing. And it's like, it was such a cool thing. I started writing behat with this premise. And over the years it shifted and I found that actually there is more under, like more interesting things there that are worth pursuing. So yeah, absolutely. It's like when you first run behat, and you start describing this, like, uh, given I am on slash when I fill in something with something. And suddenly you see Selenium pops out the browser in front of you. It's all amazing. It's like suddenly you created the test, your first test ever. And it's, it was so easy. And it's like, but when it passes, when you, like, start doing this and you do this on the project for, like, six months, and then you wrote hundreds of those tests and suddenly your test switch starts taking like an hour, <laughs> you start questioning if you did something right. <laughs> uh, and let me give you a much better selling point for BHAT uh, straight up. Uh, and it will be, sound very different and it will go from a very different angle. And the angle is, have you ever been in the situation where you start working on the feature and then it takes you longer than you expected. You expected it to take you just three days, but it takes you five days. And then after five days of hard work, you show it to the client, and client says, that's not what I wanted. Yep. Right? 
Have you ever been in the situation where you work for three days on the feature and then you show it to the QA and the QA destroys this feature in the most obvious way that makes you <laughs> face palm immediately? How, mm -hmm. did, how did I not see that? And both of those problems, uh, that's a crucially horrible detail of them, but both of those problems are avoidable. This five, those five days and three days that you just wasted, and most of which you will need to rework now, uh, you could have avoided it if you just had a conversation up front. If you just explored a bit further how this feature should work, how it should react to the user's questions just before you started implementing it. So BHAT and BDD in more general provides you with opportunity to avoid those five days of going in completely wrong direction and then overworking and redoing things and staying overnight, fixing the bugs that didn't need to be introduced in the first place. BDD and BHAT as a tool is, is a way to stop delivering to the client something they never asked for and stop delivering things that they that have obvious bugs that any QA engineer could have spotted immediately if you just described him in a problem. Yeah, I agree completely. I think we lost Jessica. Oh, geez. oh we can hear back. you. Okay, you can yeah. still hear. Me? Yeah. It's just coming. It's going in and out for me a little bit, but. We can we can always fix that in post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my audacity says it's all good. So okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Constantine, when you mentioned that um, you you're sitting there getting all excited about like running these automated tests and it pops up the browser for you and it's running all these things and it's really exciting and then uh, a, a while later you realize you've written a lot of tests and suddenly it's taking an hour to run all your tests. That's sort of the spot that I got to not too long ago and. Um, I do remember sitting there in the cafe, like testing this legacy application, and I'd written all these Bahat tests to test a donation form, and I just like pushed the test button, and I put my hands behind my head, just watching this, this all these browsers open and test it, and all these different scenarios that I could think of, and I was like, oh man, this is like rock solid. This is like, this is the best testing ever, until I realized that a it was taking forever to get through all those tests, running through all those scenarios, and then b uh, the I, I all the tests immediately started failing and I was like what's going on why aren't these tests failing and it turns out <laughs> because I was testing this against live third-party APIs we were hitting some limit uh, throttling limits <laughs> which also took down the production by the way um, oh, nice. so <laughs> what are um, what Novel, some... novelty quickly wears off does it <laughs> yes it does. <laughs> So how do I go? How do I shift my thinking from um, hit all the things and test all the things <laughs> to to be a little bit more um, I don't know strategic about uh, implementing my tests with Behat? So I think um, there's definitely layers to it. Like we've all seen that picture of the testing pyramid, right? Um, the tests that are going to be like that that take the most time to run and actually do integrate all the things very small amount of them. Um, and typically, you don't still even at that point, I don't like to actually test against a third party API unless it's a sandbox. And then they're, you know, they know they're going to, they, they have less limits on that kind of thing. Um, I would be testing on a, a doubled version of it. Um, just like in your unit tests where you mock things, um, you can provide mocked or stubbed versions of services to use for an integrated environment. Um, so I would focus on trying to do as much as I could at the lower levels. And obviously we know that's harder with legacy code, um, but there are still tools that you can put in place so that you're not actually sending email. You're not actually trying to process credit card transactions because that is going to just cause you more headaches in the long run. It makes your tests unstable, um, you know, obviously like you described, and it makes them slow. Yeah. I think it is also important to, you know, there's there's a lot of like conflicting signals because from one perspective you have a lot of blog posts and a lot of talks, um, the introductory level talks about like how um, driving driving your browser uh, through Selenium with Behat is awesome. It's like this is a good way to get into tests, and I I don't think there is necessary much wrong with this approach. Uh, there are a couple of bits that I'm sure will get into in a couple of minutes, like um, 
But in general, having when people start using Behat and they start by writing those end-to-end -end tests, there is no problem with that. The problem starts when you never stop writing those end-to-end -end tests. When it's <laughs> like all, well, all you do for the rest of the project is write those end-to-end -end tests, right? So it's it's not a problem that you you write them. It's the problem that you never stop. And at some point, you just there is this balancing act that you need to start performing, um, where you start you need to start looking at how long does it take to maintain and run those tests. And for me, there is a very clear like ten minute threshold where even ten minutes for me is it's a lot, but it's like for for many teams it should be ten minutes. If your test suit takes longer than ten minutes, you need to look very closely at your tests and start doing something about them. And the reality is. A lot of the times, when you just look at many of the tests, many of your uh, descriptions of functionality in your feature files and your VHAT, a lot of them could be rewritten to go through lower layer levels of the system, cutting yep. tens of seconds uh, easily. Um, I had this exercise multiple times with different teams where just by rewriting the way you address particular steps or step definitions, Without rewriting your features, you can sometimes achieve like twenty times increase just because you cut those like database and UI layers, right? And it's all about like having this balance. I think people are leaning all the time to simple answers, right? It's just like oh, it's just like UI tests, so all the all the tests will be UI all the time, which is fine for as long as you from time to time keep asking yourself a question: Am I doing the right thing, right? And if your tests take longer than ten minutes. Uh, you need to start asking this question more often, right? Am I doing the right thing? And is there a way to speed the tests up? Because when the tests take longer than 10 minutes, they stop being very helpful and start being just burdensome. And when, the, when your tests aren't helping, you just don't use them. That's the biggest problem with it. You mentioned layers. Your your data, if you're able to strip out the database and UI layers and kind of test sort of like maybe more of the domain, um, Layers that you're you're really kind of trying to test. I'm curious how your approach is. Um, I'm going to throw out this approach and see if 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 this kind of agrees with both of you uh, of of inheriting a legacy application, for example, that doesn't have necessarily clear layers that you can separate out and start testing. So for for my approach is just write up um, the thing I don't need to refactor. Write out a, a behat test that tests that tests it straight up from the the UI all the way down the database and just come up with a bunch of dis different scenarios that. That it that it can test um, just hitting it like that the really long test that you sit back and you realize you're hitting all these third party APIs live and all that stuff in the live database or not a live database but a database um, and then and then as you start to refactor that and those tests are still passing to be able to start testing those individual layers that you've refactored and then eventually start ripping out those original tests that you had what are your thoughts on on that kind of approach into maybe like specifically with a legacy application I mean I think that sounds great. Um, you're you're kind of describing um, I've taken with legacy applications. I have a talk I've done where you know I, I talk about how we rewrote our legacy application and how big of a help BHAT was because we were able to describe all of the existing features um, and we kind of tackled them bit by bit. We picked something, described it to make sure that it was completely covered. Um, and again, we didn't actually like hit the credit card processor. We used a fake. Um, but we still had it running and we had it running in the, a headless browser. So it was still faster than um, actually launching a browser. Um, and then factoring or rewriting basically that part of the application and we're able to write unit tests for that code, start writing integration tests, some of it in PHP unit, some of it in BHAT. And then once we're done, we only really needed to keep the original end to end tests that were the most important. Um, we didn't have to keep every single case to hang around and make sure it didn't break because now we had all these other faster, lower level tests to work off of to catch the actual bugs um, if someone did break something. Um, so that's an approach I've used and kind of sounds similar to what you're describing. Yeah, it's a very close approach that um, me and Matthias Veras, like a couple of I think a year ago, maybe, uh, wrote a blog post called like test migration, and it's basically like what you're describing, uh, both of you. It's essentially 
you start like if you're dealing with a system with a legacy system which uh, is very kind of entangled and it's very hard to separate it's absolutely fine to start with end to end test right it's like because any other way uh, around it it's not a, it's not just it's a, it's it's absolutely fine to start it's, it's in many cases just the only way you can start with because all you need to do is you need to start refactoring the system and you can't start refactoring the system when you're not sure that you're not breaking it. So you need to wrap it into some kind of very high level, very fragile, very slow, but a test that can verify that you didn't broke a system while you're refactoring, right? Uh, and then through refactoring this, the system underneath and running this test, you can verify that while system still behaves from the user perspective as it should, you get it to the point where you can start applying changes that can apply lower level tests like unit tests and integration tests around the smaller pieces of that system. And you get to the point where having those 10 end to end very slow fragile tests is not important. Maybe you will be fine with just leaving one of them. Or maybe you will decide, you know what, we have those 10 scenarios which are end to end and go through UI but for this particular feature, it's fine if nine of them will go through lower level. They go directly through the domain model, separately from uh, from the database, separately from UI, right? And they will run almost immediately because all, all of this is in memory while still running through Behat. So you give yourself that opportunity to evolve. What I see happens a lot instead of that with legacy systems and a lot of the teams is that they wrap their big ball of muds with uh, a test, like a BHAT or any other uh, end-to-end -end test. And then they get this like this false confidence, um, and I call it false confidence because it, it doesn't give them confidence, but it's like this confidence evaporates really, really quickly uh, while this this end-to-end -end really slow, fragile test is still there. And then they make a change and then they keep that test and they never refactor the system, right? They introduced the change that they wanted in the legacy system and then they never refactored anything and never introduced any lower level unit tests. And then what happens over time is you accumulate those end to end fragile slow tests and your system just accumulates this technical debt inside so you never get yourself into the better position. So it should be this elaborate process of right end-to-end test, but from the point where you wrote an end-to-end -end test, the, the timer starts ticking of you trying to eliminate or make this end-to-end -end test not be an end-to-end -end test. Because end-to-end -end tests are very expensive. Sometimes necessary, in a lot of the times actually necessary tools, but very expensive if they stick around. Yeah, that's, I, I, that's definitely very similar to the the path that I found myself taking going down, um, realizing that starting having way too many end-to-end -end tests and sort of like, okay, now I definitely needed to change something about this. The At ZenCon 2016, that just wrapped up a couple weeks ago, Uncle Bob Martin was giving a keynote, and he was talking about um, how if he opens up an application, oftentimes he can tell exactly what framework it was built on. Like, for example, if, he's op if he opens up a Rails app, you open up that root folder, you can see it's a Rails app. If you open up Laravel, you can see it's a Laravel app. But he was talking about how in software, he wants to see intention. There's no intention when you look at this Rails app. Set. It's just like, it is a Rails app. Like, what does the app do? I don't know. It's a Rails app. And he showed a picture of like um, some blueprints for like a church, for example. And you can see the intention in the architecture of that blueprint. It was like a really cool thing. I was like, whoa, this is like really opening up my mind to these ideas of like, um, so how do I show intention in that kind of root folder of of the app? And you're probably thinking, where am I going with this? But um, the, the app. I was thinking about like your app logic versus your domain logic, you know, like separating that framework logic from the stuff that really matters to your stakeholders, for your clients, for your whatever you're trying to build. Um, and I was trying to think, okay, so if we have this really great layered app where the the application, the database, the UI, then the the domain logic is all split up in all these layers, and you have this onion that you can just start isolating with tests, how do I go about isolating, for example, the UI? Like, if I don't want to have a full end-to-end -end test that goes from UI to DB, but I want to, like, I would just want to isolate, say, I have a Vue.js app that I need to make sure that at least those components are working on the front-end side with uh, with um, Selenium or something. How do I go about just kind of isolating that layer? Do you have any st strategies for isolating layers like that? If it's something that um, would 
typically just be hitting like a RESTful API then, um, you can fake those calls, um, set it up to hit like a Docker container that's just running a simple uh, script to return basic data instead of actually executing any logic um, or just even like simple JSON files. Um, I think the, the recent drive towards microservices made a lot of that stuff easier and more common. Um, but yeah, I would definitely test the UI on its own. Um, there are also different, uh, JavaScript behavior testing tools as well as unit testing tools now um, that are going to do the same thing, eliminate a lot of need for a lot of those end-to-end -end UI. Um, but yeah, I would I would just use dummy data rather than actually trying to run the application behind at all possible. The interesting thing for me is, and and this is this is one caveat that I was mentioning where I don't have a problem with people using the head for end-to-end -end testing, and the caveat is as long as they their feature files are written in UI agnostic way, right? So mm -hmm. and. The only way, from my perspective, to, to do this, and this is this is where I'm having a problem with that, is when people write those feature files without having that conversation, where they, they basically short circuit. They they take the wall approach to BDD and the wall approach that Behat is supposed to support, which is behavior driven development. Uh, the approach looks like this: you have a conversation, you write the conversation down, you automate the conversation, you implement the functionality that fulfills that automated conversation promise. What, what I see people do with UI tests, and it's like I don't have a problem with you going through this process and your automation being UI automation. What I see happening instead is people short circuit or skip the conversation bit. And they write an automated test, which looks like automated test in the feature file, which describes UI, goes through UI, describes URLs, describes buttons, and describes uh, clicking into the forms and things like that, and then they test through UI. And there's not much you can do with this feature file anymore, right? It's not. It's a documentation of your entangled system, including UI, including backend. So, and this is the unfortunate detail: not the fact that you're testing UI, the fact that the way you described your examples of the system behavior are very entangled with the way your user interface is. And the only way forward was this is basically go step back and start having those conversations that you just skipped and start rewriting your features in the way that actually describes the intention, describes what you are just like what you care about or what your users care about. And users don't care about the buttons. They don't care about the labels <laughs> on the buttons. They care about producing a particular report or creating a particular or adding attaching a particular credit card or um, connecting with some user or sending somebody a message. They don't care about the buttons, text fields, URLs. All of that is just accidental complexity that we have in, in our user interfaces and in our browsers. And those are things that actually make your tests fragile in the long run, too. So that's. Exactly. And I think what, what people miss is like what Gherkin allows you to do is it allows you to separate completely how you describe your system behavior from how you test it. So as long as you like push it back and you have this conversation and you describe what people actually care about, that will be very separate from UI. I don't really care from that point onwards if you go through user interface or you go through the main model. You can use your exactly same scenario to mm -hmm. test the main model in separation from all the databases. or Maybe you start with a big ball of, of mud and you use exactly the same scenario, which describes the behavior in separation from any UI, and test through end to end. And when you approach the situation, you start seeing a very interesting pattern. An interesting pattern is that when your scenarios are completely devoid of any implementation detail or UI detail, and they just describe what people expect system to do, you can start using those scenarios not only from the PHP side of things, oh, OK, so it's like I can test end-to-end -end using Selenium or end-to-end -end using uh, some headless browser, or maybe go through the main model. You can look at this feature file, and you can ask yourself, OK, is there JavaScript implementation of Behat? 
And there is, there is a Cucumber GS that operates on the exactly same feature files. So what you can do from this point is you can take the same description, same documentation, same scenarios that you just wrote, and test your UI in isolation from your backend using the same examples, right? Using Cucumber GS. And suddenly you have this description, canonical description of what people expect your system to do, and your tests are automatically test like very fine or validating that your UI behaves in this way, your domain beha behaves in this way. And for a small fraction of those descriptions, your, your entire system ends to end behaves this way. So yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great point to make. I've actually done that before where we've taken the same feature files and run BHAT Cucumber JS tests off them to test the different areas of the application. Um, and it was a great way to confirm that both of those parts uh, behaved the same way that we wanted without having to, you know, run an actual browser. Because um, that is one of the things where people just, it slows down so much and people give up on it is using the actual browser. Um, and, you know, when you can do that, when you can run the same test on the different layers of the website, you probably wrote a really good test um, or a really good feature. So yeah. um, I definitely encourage people to do that. Yeah, and I, it's like, that's the thing. It's, it's an awesome opportunity. And you don't need to do it all the time, but I don't see people doing it nearly enough. They should. Um, I was going to say, I think this is probably part of the reason that BHAT no longer has the default steps in it of, like, I click on a link. I remember when that got removed, a lot of people were upset because they were like, I write my tests that say I fill in this form field or I click on this link, and now you took away the actual PHP code for it. Um, and I think there was a really good reason for taking that stuff away. They're not in Cucumber anymore, but they're still in BHAT, and I'm, I'm really, really... Right. I'm really considering removing them, and I think we will remove them um, in the next big release of, of Mink extension. Because, yeah, there's like, it's the thinking process behind removing them or adding them and, re and then removing them in Cucumber was exactly the same as in Behat, which is it helps people to get into it, right? It helps people to start understanding, doing the wrong thing, but understanding how the underlying <laughs> principles and technologies work. So that is not a problem on its own. The problem is people never stop, right? So it's like you show them, like you give them those training wheels, uh, and they never just drop. They they keep they keep riding this bicycle on three wheels, even when they're <laughs> thirty years old, um, and that's the problem. And it's like it got such a big, it got set to such an extent in cucumber community that they just removed those. And I think we're getting to the same point with Behat, where those out of the box mink steps were like given I fill in, like, when I fill in the field, blah, with text, we just need, we'll need to get rid of them because people just don't stop using them for some reason. People don't, the assumption was always people learn how the, th how the underlying things work and they switch to actually do it BDD. And rarely that happens, sadly. I can definitely see how when you're writing tests for the first time with Behat and you're used to writing unit tests where you're really outlining very specifically, you're, you're testing the smallest unit of code, you have the exact thing that you're looking for, and you're like, this, this function needs this argument, and this, this output is what I'm expecting, and I'm going to analyze this output like this. Like, I think it's, it is kind of a, a hard switch in the mind to turn it into, um, uh, how do I write a test uh, in Gherkin, you know, using basically a user story um, with a lot of general language, right? And so I feel like we're, we've got the developers on this side thinking, OK, the client wants this donation form thing, and so that means I need like a, I need uh, some some third party APIs to integrate with to charge the card. I need to fill out these fields. I need to click on this button. I need so I'm, I'm writing a test like it's literally I visit the forward slash donate page. I um, I fill in the first first underscore name field with this name. I fill in the last underscore last uh, last name field with my last name, mm. and like literally going through and clicking and dropping down in the in the actual test itself, uh, I'm sorry, in the actual um, user story itself. Whereas the client may be coming from a, a perspective of like, um, oh, maybe almost too vague. And it's like, um, I just want people to donate. So as a person who wants to donate, I donate and it works. And that's like, <laughs> I feel like way too general for a test. So where how, do you have any good strategies of like, how do we kind of get the client to write better user stories and get the developer to write more 
uh, or I should say, how do we get the client to write more specific user stories and get the developer to write uh, less specific user story to make it more a little bit more ambiguous? So let let me try to kind of to push back on this one a bit because I think the missing bit in all of this uh, is one word, and that is conversation, right? And yeah, it's, like it's a group what effort. We're try it's a group what we're trying to achieve here is not we're not trying to make product owner write better tests, and we're not trying to make uh, testers write better user stories. What we're trying to do is we're trying to basically heal the rift between those two parties that was <laughs> was being created for for decades now. Uh, we're trying to put like create a situation where product owner being very vague sits in the same room with a tester who's being very specific. And they, through conversation and through caring about each other, find a language that fulfills the needs of both of them, right? Because essentially, what I see when people start trying to have a, when developers, uh, not not yet indoctrinated in behavior-driven development, start participating in those conversations, they are very detailed. But very quickly, you can pinpoint to them that look, you're like stakeholder gets very bored right it's like you can see people just you, people losing it when you when you keep talking about forms fields and stuff can you try to abstract it a bit more so when people start interacting with each other and caring about like okay how does like how does we how do we perceive it do we still understand each other if i keep talking about the forms are you still interested in this conversation or do i need to abstract it away okay if you keep te if you keep telling me that it's just as a i need to uh, is it enough information for me as a developer? No, I need a bit more. So you develop this pattern of conversation, which is purely based around the simple question: Can you give me an example? Right. Uh, as a as a reader, uh, in order to spend a bit more time on the website, I would be able. To, I would like to comment. And like, okay, can you give me an example of how you would comment? And it's like, okay. So I write a comment. Uh, and then I press, I, I write, hello, great article, uh, but I would add this, this, and that. And then I submit it, and it shows up on the website. And then the Q, uh, QA engineer sits next to you and says, OK, but what if I write, hey, screw you, and <laughs> submit it? And it's like, do, does everybody see it straight away? And product owner, oh, wait, no. We shouldn't allow things like that being submitted. It's like, OK, how can we disallow it? Oh, somebody should approve the things before they go live. And like this is a kind of conversation that you unravel. And it's like, notice that there is no forms, buttons, submits in it, right? You stay at this very crucial, crucial high level of interaction where you tease out details that are unclear for everyone. Because as soon as you do this, figuring out which fields, buttons um, you need and how many pages are there, engineers can do that very easily, right? As soon as you understand the underlying intention, as soon as you understand the constraints around the problem, you can come up with those implementation details. What's important is trying to understand the boundaries of the problem you're, tr you're trying to solve with a, with a technology. And for that, there is no better way than just having a normal human conversation and caring about each other, caring about the problem while you're talking about it. Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of things that stand out to me. And um, I've actually gone multiple places and taught the engineering teams how to do TDD and BDD. And people are always, the developers want to know how to write behavior tests. And the answer is always the same. We're going to sit in a room with the product owner. And I like to try and include someone from each kind of specialty field. So if you're designing something and you have database-specific engineers, I'll bring them in. If you have separate UI engineers and backend engineers, I want one of each of them in there. And then the product owner, um, someone who has an uh, interest in the business uh, stake to, to be there, and everyone is talking about it and providing the input from their point of view. Um, the other thing that I really liked about Constantine's example was he's talking about exploring multiple paths through the thing and asking for examples of how they, you know, how they would actually use the application. Um, one thing that I think is really important is once you have those examples to then translate them into more of a intention-based 
user story. So I try and encourage people to, instead of actually writing a feature that says, I put in a comment that says, hey, screw you, um, mm. I, would, <laughs> I would describe that more as like someone has put in a negative comment and them, or even you don't even have to describe the fact that it's a negative comment. You've, you've identified the fact that you need the moderator. So then you have an example where I put in a comment and a moderator rejects it. You don't have to actually fill in to your user story specific text. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really helps make those features a lot more about the communication and the documentation than about the, the UI. Yep. Um, yeah. I've noticed a lot with working with clients over the years um, as a freelancer is that I, I used to approach new projects thinking that the client knows exactly what they want and all my job is to just extract <laughs> their ideas and put it into code. But what I've realized... No one knows what they want. They have no idea. They have a general idea of what they want, but, yeah. but really they don't know exactly really right. what they want. And a lot of the conversations that we end up having is guiding if you're like, well, do you want this or this? And I feel like this is exactly what you guys are talking about is if we just try to start with the uh, acceptance test. <laughs> so you like write, narrow down the scope to what it is exactly what they want. And then, like you said, the, the QA person who says, oh, what happens? Do we need to, to, to write um, approval for this? And, and I have also noticed that it, it, it this can kind of tie into this uh, domain-driven design idea of yes. what you're naming things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that you're, you're feeding back into what they call things and you're using their terms and then maybe you realize that there's a term that they don't even have a name for. And it's like mm -hmm. we come up with a term and we use it to it sort of together. Is this sort of the same thing you both are seeing? Yeah, I've had people ask me how BDD differs from using DSL, domain specific language. And I'm like, my behavior tests, my user stories are a domain specific language. You're describing in that narrative as a some role, you're defining specific roles within your domain. And then I want some feature. You're describing those features that exist only in your domain. You're not describing, you know, generic things typically like uh, I want to get an email. Um, but if, if you are, that's part of your domain, is that you have an email uh, model of some kind. Um, that is a huge part of building that domain-specific language. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that there is so much uh, overlapping between domain-driven design and behavior-driven development communities. And the reason for that is like one of the central pieces of both of them uh, is ubiquitous language. Uh, it's a language created for the problem-solving purpose uh, and shared between business and the technology um, experts working on the project. And it is the reason why it's in both is because it is crucial for you discussing the problem and being on the same page while you're discussing a problem and making sure that you're 100% understood what solution or what what problem you're trying to solve but at the same time it's also crucial for your design because you if you can align your design with a language that the business uses then you can align your design or evolution of your design with evolution of that business uh, so you make cha ongoing changes simpler so it, it's one of those examples where just because the root of the system uh, here being ubiquitous language is the same in both BDD and DDD. Uh, you get benefits in, in multiple planes or in different stages of your of, of your development, and it's absolutely not coincidence. Uh, I would say that in many cases, I heard from from domain driven design community that when people do behavior driven development right, that's one of the easiest way to get into domain driven design, right? Because if you do have this conversation uh, and you do care about each other in that conversation and you do write those conversations down and you transform them into acceptance tests and then you drive your system design and implementation using those acceptance tests, then using language of the conversation in the design is just one small marginal step from there, right? It's it's not a huge revolution. It's suddenly you realize that instead of creating a new words, you can re reuse the words from your scenario. And this is how you, you can just basically bridge this gap between two worlds. And there is, not, there is no, not much divergence or conflict between two um, 
two approaches and they're very much supplemental to each other. There is a lot of overlap between practices, practitioners and communities of BDD and DDD in general for that reason. Through that, I'd love to wrap this, uh, or not wrap it up, or, or kind of start um, thinking about the ending of this thing by kind of talking about some um, actual implementation details as far as, say you have a project that already has unit tests, you want to implement BHAT, you have a, a test folder, and in the root of the test folder you have all your PHP unit uh, tests. How do you recommend um, just bringing in B BHAT from there? Well, by default, um it expects you to put them actually in a top level folder called features. Um, and I think that's neat because you put the actual feature files up there. So anyone who's just diving into the project, like if they open up that project, they don't have to dig around in the test folder. They open the features and there's all those English, you know, Gherkin features for them to read. Um, I said English because I normally am speaking to an English speaking audience, but obviously you can do it in other languages. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's another subfolder under that that powers all the PHP code. Um, the other thing that I've seen done is to move them. Um, people do put their unit tests in the test folder, but I always have subfolders in that. I have a unit, I have test slash unit and then test slash integration that are broken down by namespacing by my um, different domains. Um, and then, so you could add your third folder in there for the PHP code, but I would still want to keep the features, I think, at the top level, just so that someone doesn't have to dig around in the code base to find that basically documentation of how those features are supposed to work. I th this convention, I think, it's, it's one of those things that um, we borrowed from Cucumber community and never looked back, um, and I think, <laughs> It's one of those things which is like which were right from from the beginning by design. The features folder and the the feature extension. It's it's essentially a description of what your system does from the user perspective, from their from the system's user perspective. So the the easiest way to think about it is think about it as as documentation first, uh, specification second, and then. A, a, a something that can create an automated test as like the last thing on the list, right? So usually it's very common that when I work on the project with, with other people, features folder is the first thing that we create in the project for, right? It's so like we create a Git repository, it's empty. The first thing that gets there is a features folder. The next thing that gets there is we have a conversation, uh, we either towards the end of the conversation or after the conversation even, write that conversation down in Gherkin and put that into that folder. And then we start scaffolding around it. So the way to think about it is like features folder contains description or specification of what human beings that are expected to use the system expect from that system, right? Uh, and it's not a UI, it's just general behavior. And then you can, Outside of it, use tools like Behat, Cucumber, Ruby, Cucumber, Java, Cucumber, JS, and others uh, to use those descriptions and test your system around those. But that's just kind of think about it as a separate process. So in Behat, you have like this bootstrap folder under the features, but you can move it anywhere you want. So Behat shares the composer autoloader. So you can put your context classes anywhere you want, and Behat should still be able to find them. Um, so Essentially, think about it this way. Your context classes or where you put your step definitions is a very different thing to your feature files. There is no one-to-one -one relationship. And in many cases, especially with Suits and Behat 3, uh, the relationship could be many-to-many -many in many, many cases. The core thing there is write a specification, put them into the features folder. You can even rename it to documentations folder if you care about that. Uh, and then, I like features a lot. I think it's a really good word to describe what you're writing there. So I think it was perfect. I agree with you. <laughs> and then start building, start building your test suite around that. And if you've wrote your features in the right way, and the right way is just purely based on the conversation with non-tech, then your features will give you this opportunity when you start writing a test, when you start automating them, you will have this complete flexibility of, do I test it through UI? Do I test it through the main? 
do I test it on JavaScript layer? Because they don't mention any of those things, right? So you're completely free to exercise your application at different levels against every single one of those features. So it's in this case, in this case, you might end up with having single feature folder, but then having multiple contexts spread throughout your code base, right? Because you have different layers tested against it in the same way. But I would still benefit greatly if I I read your I open your code base for the first time and I see the features folder there. I know where to start and I know how to learn about your system in the shortest amount of time possible. It's just open in this folder and read through the files there. Do you find that reading through the feature files also gives a hint of implementation details through just by the way that you're breaking up the layers? Like if you're if you're testing the API endpoints versus the UI layer um, and that kind of thing, if the client doesn't even know what an API endpoint is and they're looking at the features that test specifically that feature, does that, does that leak, uh, so to speak, um, implementation details into the feature files? Uh I personally never, I, I moved away, not, not never, I moved away from using Gherkin for API tests. Uh, but the teams I'm working with sometimes do that. And it's there is nothing extremely wrong about that. Uh, but if you do this, I would separate it from the features that are, that are more user facing, right? Because essentially, when you're writing your Gherkin features and you describe basically your REST API, this feature is not for humans. This feature is for robot, right? It's for API client. So I would put it in, in maybe a different place, maybe a different subfolder under the features folder and separate it explicitly from the rest of the feature files that are for humans, right? That are supposed to be readable by non-tech product owner to whom you can just give a link or give access to your GitHub repository who can just hey, open this fit folder, and he can just open it and get through that with, with syntax highlight and see, OK, that, yeah, that makes sense. That The syntax looks a bit wonky, but I understand what's written there, so it does make sense to me. Is that true for, so if, if I were to take a, if I think of Gherkin as just sort of basically my user stories for testing UI um, elements and end-to-end -end testing, like if I, if I wanted to just separate the UI layer and then I wanted a full end-to-end -end test, those would be the, basically the, the two sort of approaches, or uh, two two things that we'd be testing with Gherkin, and then outside of that, any other layer we would be te we would be testing it some other way. I I would I would suggest to try really really hard to write your features in the way that is, and I'm saying like a lot the word agnostic in the way that it doesn't tell you if this feature goes through UI or not. So imagine when you're describing your scenarios, when you're giving your examples, when you're writing like scenario. The way you write it, the way you write your given when thens, is you write them in the way that even if developer reads them, he doesn't necessarily understand what UI is there. He doesn't know if it's a desktop UI, if it's a GUI, if it's a mobile application, or if it's a web application. And when you can describe a behavior of the feature uh, in the way that fits mobile application, desktop GUI, or a web, you know that you have a good scenario on your hand. And then you don't need to have that separation between UI and other stuff. If you do want to test your REST API, uh, you will have those like given I send it, when I send the post request somewhere. But again, this is not for humans separated out. And I would I might even go as far as like use slightly different tools for that, maybe. But in general, try to avoid situations where you write where you write stories that are we write scenarios, sorry, that are full of this UI or implementations that hint towards how you will implement this particular feature, that you will use web interface for this feature. Try to describe behavior uh, and try to describe how people will interact with the system without actually mentioning what kind of system, what kind of system it is, if it makes sense. And I think the way to think about it is like think about it this way. You have your user stories, which is a very temporal thing uh, in Agile. Basically, user story is, is a description of a system in time or a change in the system in time. And as soon as you implemented it, you burn the card. It's, it's gone away. Two weeks later, you might get another user story, which is completely different. So user stories sometimes drive feature files or features in your system. So this is where your 
feature file in Behat comes. And each feature is basically a set of functionality that could be illustrated using examples. So I'm saying, oh, users can comment on our in, in, in our system. That's a feature. And then I would ask you, can you give me an example of users commenting in the system? And you, you will give me an example. And then somebody will come up, what if users put root comment? And that's another example. So Gherkin features or those files that you put under the features folder is essentially subsystems or parts of your system, like features in your system that people using the system care about. And you give examples of, of, of how people will use these things without any UI details, without any database details or things like that. And then you use those descriptions to test your system through UI or maybe even through directly through the main layer just to make sure that your system fulfills that obligation or that expectation. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, absolutely. I feel like that's, that's, <clears throat> that really nails it or makes it clear to, to to how I should separate this kind of stuff out. And, and as far as um, just really focusing on that, that human aspect, I think really helps to, um, you know, as a programmer, I'm wanting to think implementation details, implementation details, and specific things, but like, <laughs> but just trying yeah, it's to. It's all about the intention. Yeah. Yeah. The, way, the interesting way to think about it is like, think about it this way UI, and I know it's like we're not primed this way, but UI is implementation detail. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why I'm saying I'm not doing, I'm not using Gherkin for REST anymore is that API, REST, your JSON responses is also implementation detail. So it's like I don't see any more, I don't see much more sense in writing uh, Gherkin scenarios around REST than I, than I see sense in writing Gherkin scenarios around HTML, right? So in one case, you send, your server sends an HTML response that browser interprets. In another case, you have server sending rest JSON response that some other client interprets. The difference between two is not as huge as you might think. In the, in the end run, there is always a human being somewhere at the end using either mobile application that uses REST API interacting with your server or some other person that uses browser that interprets HTML that your server responds. In both cases, independent of what you actually write in the code, what you try to do is you try to make those end people interacting with your system, either through API or through HTML, make their lives easier or better, right? And our job is not to fulfill the needs of some, uh, some REST client, some, some heartless machine, right? Not until like the Skynet is there. Our job, <laughs> is, our job is to help people go about their lives better. And it's very hard to do that if you don't think about them. So I find it very beneficial and uh, greatly empowering when even when you just create, create an API for third party and when your product is all just API, you still think about the people that will end up using the products built on top of your API, right? Because no matter what you think, those are the people that you, you build this thing for, right? Because your API exposes data. And it doesn't matter how the data is used. What matters is how people will benefit from that data in the long run. Because if they wouldn't, nobody will create clients for your API. <laughs> True. Well, it's kind of getting, we're running a little bit over time. I mean, we started a little late too, but um, I did want to at least kind of wrap up with a um, a quick rundown of how either of you might approach a scenario where you've inherited um, this particular application. It's got a donation form on it. So if if you have these sort of, the, the existing features is that you can make a donation whether you're logged in or logged out. You can pay with credit card, e-check, or PayPal. And in, you can do a one-time donation, or you can set up a recurring donation. But the thing is, if you set up a recurring donation, you can have it set up so that it charges you monthly or twice monthly. And the last thing is you can set your recurring donation to start at a future date and time. So like all of those scenarios combined, it, it generates a lot of different scenarios. So how would you go about maybe approaching um, uh, testing that from a legacy application uh, point of view, because you got you have to go in there and refactor all that. 
So um, <clears throat> you, you're right in that you're definitely describing a lot of different scenarios. Um, I don't I'm know that you, features. Yeah, I, you're, yeah, I'm sorry. You're definitely describing multiple features, each with multiple scenarios. And you don't need to test each of those um, through the entire process, um, most likely unless you've identified some very specific bug. I would try and write those so that you're just testing the specific branches at which things actually change. So I'm not going to test filling out the entire form for all three payment types logged in and logged out. I'm going to test, can I access the form logged in and can I access it logged out? And then regardless, I'm going to do one of the different payment types um, and the different recurring payment types. Um, a lot of those could probably just be um, uh, scenario outlines with multiple examples um, because it doesn't sound like the behavior in terms of like how you pay is going to change. So you're just trying to test and make sure that each of your payment options is there. Um, that, that would be one I think that's going to end up being very UI specific. Um, and I, you know, would, I guess the behavior is going to change in, in how it's going to then get sent to a payment processor. Um, so maybe you want to check and see what is communicated to the, to the API. Um, but yeah, you're, you're definitely describing several different features that don't all need to be tested with each other, you know. Yeah, and I would say don't don't uh, like it's implied all the time uh, when we're talking about this. But it's like don't forget about the actually having conversation with with people when you're writing those things down. So the first thing that I would do if I'm joining the company uh, that works on those features and I need to change something about them, I would find a person that actually either implemented them or cares about those. Maybe like uh, I don't know, marketing department or procurement department. And I will speak with somebody there for five minutes. No need to write anything down. No, no need to make it like super explicit. Just have a conversation back and forth. So it's like, what do I need to keep in mind? What is important? And what you will find out is like, even through this conversation, you will find what parts of this thing are super important and what part of those thing mm -hmm. of this thing aren't important. You will find out really quickly with in actual conversation with real people that. You know what? PayPal is used by 95% of our users. So if that thing goes down, we're losing money uh, every minute. But if any other provider goes down, uh, it kind of is a big deal, but we can live with it for a bit longer. So that immediately gives you an indication of like where do you need to apply a bit more test pressure uh, and where you can just afford you know, like having maybe a bit lower and faster unit test uh, instead of just testing the entire stack. That's a great point. Yeah. Those are all good things. I, I've, uh, it's funny how um, when you were describing sort of like the general path of like how what most people follow, I'm like, yep, been there. And then just <laughs> this whole conversation of like what 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 is the good way to go? And I've I've been encouraged because some of these things I'm like, okay, yeah, I figured that one out on my own. But these other things I'm like, oh crap, I <laughs> I definitely was uh, failing on that one. So I really appreciate both of your feedback on this. This has uh, been very educational for me and hopefully for those listening as well. Um, when they're diving into Behat and, and doing some more uh, different types of testing. Um, and I would like to at least mention that we have a uh, repo out there at github.com slash php roundtable. Um, it's called show dash notes. If you're listening along and you're sitting here like absorbing all this knowledge, just write down some notes and mark down and then submit it as a PR to the show notes. And I'll give you a personal shout out on the on air for submitting the show notes. Um, and I would like to wrap up here officially with a developer shout out, which is a segment that recognizes a developer for who has contributed a lot to the community. Um, and uh, for that developer, we have a $50 Amazon gift card to give them, and it is sponsored by Laracasts, um, which all of this money that Laracasts um, gives, 100% of it goes back to the developers. And Laracasts, if you don't know, is a great uh, website where you can go and learn about things about PHP. It's all screencasts that you can just sit down and you don't have to like read anything. You're just literally like watching a movie and learning about PHP or IDEs or tests. Um, so. Uh, definitely check that out. Thank you, Laircast, for being uh, for sponsoring for so long. 
Um, for this episode, I asked the panel, panel to nom nominate somebody who uh, deserves a de developer shout out, shout out. I am having a good time with this whole uh, talking thing today. Uh, this this particular person, um, we don't know their last name, but uh, the person is Wooter J. So, uh, Constantine, what what is why is uh, Wooter J uh, the developer shout out for today? I posted, by the way, that his Twitter uh, account in the chat. So. Uh, oh, yes. Basically, Wooter was, or is, one of the big, one of the longest time contributors to BHAT. Um, and he, he was one of the people to say thank for um, JUnit for Modern and uh, in BHAT version 3. Um, he didn't start that pull request. There were many people that started it. But he was the person that actually pushed it over the finish line and uh, merged it. And it, that wasn't been his. Uh, only contribution. Uh, there was many more throughout the years, and I hope it wasn't been his last. I think it's very important that every single community lives and dies by people contributing to it, not just you know like the stars that you see speaking at the conferences and like boosting the things. It's more about people that care and use the tools and contribute back. And I think. I'm very grateful to be part of this community. And I'm very grateful for people like Walter basically contributing back and spending their free time uh, working on the tool that I created. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it's, very, it's very great fitting when somebody else cares about the thing that you spend so much time doing and somebody else feels urge to contribute their, their own free time into that. Um, so thank you for that, Walter. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Awesome. Thanks so much, Wooter. I'm going to try to get in contact with you um, to get your snail mail address and send you the, uh, the thank you note in the giant PHP roundtable sticker. Um, and I'd like to wrap this up finally with uh, maybe some shameless plugs. Does uh, anybody, does anybody want to start us off here with uh, something shamelessly promotional? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll start. Um, All right. I, have, uh, I have my blog, jmauerhand.wordpress.com. There's not a ton of content on it, but I'm always asking people what kind of topics they want to see um, posts about related to testing, software design, anything like that. Um, so there's some stuff right there uh, out there right now about unit testing and behavior testing, um, as well as links to all of my talks that I've done. So um, if anyone has questions about any kind of testing or software design stuff, send them over to me so that I know a little bit more about what you guys want to see. Excellent. What about you, Constantine? you have anything you want to promote? Well, I guess the most important thing in the context of this conversation is uh, github.com slash bhat slash bhat uh, is the cool project that is worth contributing to. Um, and I have a blog under stakeholder stakeholderwhisper.com, um, where I basically write uh, more on this client interaction and conversation side of things, uh, which might be interesting for engineers as much as, as a business people, like how to bridge this gap in communication, how to talk about very important but complicated subjects between each other. And I think the most important one, if you want to learn more, if you're in London next week and you want to learn more about BDD in general, uh, there is an amazing conference that is going on, BDD Exchange 2016. I'm speaking there to many other great community members and people speaking there. Dan North is speaking there. So come say hi uh, and join many amazing talks. Um, hope to see you there. Awesome. Well, our next episode is going to be one of the cursed episodes that we've been trying to <laughs> trying to get out here for a long time now. It was one that we were every every time we'd send something out, something would happen, and you no, know, there would be a scheduling conflict. But it is hourly versus value based pricing is the is the topic. I've been really excited about um, talking about that one, um, and then that's going to be followed up by another cursed episode that we've been trying to get out there for a while: logging and crash reporting in PHP. And we're going to be talking about setting up Elk stacks. Um, what, do you, what is an Elk stack? We're going to be talking about all that stuff. Um, and there's going to be a couple of other tentatively scheduled uh, December episodes. One I definitely want to get to is PHP 7.1, which is going to be released very soon. We're on release candidate something. What is it? Release candidate 5 or 4? Let's see. 
always check the release candidate five. Yay, released on October 27th. So we're getting really close to the final release on that one. Uh, and we're also going to be talking about Fig 3.0 in mid-December, maybe, maybe early January. I don't know. But there's been a lot of things happening in the Fig recently. PHP Fig has been restructured to three, Fig 3.0. So we're going to get some figgies on here and sit under the fig tree and eat some figs and talk about <laughs> PHP Fig. Uh, and then we're going to also um, do some cool things with, I was wanting to start to talk about specific frameworks or specific sort of framework ecosystems. So I think the first one we're going to be talking about is Zend framework. Um, so we're going to kind of be talking about all things Zend in an episode coming up. And I'd like to hit up some other frameworks and uh, see about maybe doing some some fun things with uh, PHP roundtable discussions on frameworks and things like that. Um, if you have something that you would like to share on the PHP Roundtable, you have an idea for a topic or something, I'd love to hear about it. Hit me up. I'm on uh, Sammy K on Twitter, or you can ping PHP Roundtable, or you can go to the website, phproundtable.com, and there's a form there you can fill out, and you'd be like, hey, I want to join the Roundtable, or hey, I've got an idea. I'd love to have you on. I'd like to thank Jessica and Constantine for joining us for this discussion, and we'll see you folks in the next episode. Okay, bye. bye.